Well, hello. Hello. Hi. 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 So there's a nice crowd. Excellent. <laughs> nice sideways crowd because. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Our show. We're pleased to have you here with us today. No, well, thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. All right. Anything you want to say before we get started with the questions? Well, I'm just I'm very happy to be here, and thank you for having me. No That's problem. my official um, glad to be here line. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I want to know too. On who am I talking to? Which one of you is who? I'm Tanith. Tanith and Quinn, yep. right? Okay. So I'm the 2013 convention chair. Okay. And Tanith has been chair in prior years. And I'm just the monkey. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He's the one getting the rig going. Yep. All right. So let's get started with the questions. Okay. Apparently I'm reading the first one uh, from Zephyr. Uh, I've always thought that the depth of the myth story was incredible, so I'd like to know what uh, your main influences were while you were creating the myth backstory. Um, I think there were uh, obviously a lot of different influences. Uh, Rand and I shared um, influences like C.S. Lewis, <coughs> sorry, Chronicles of Narnia was an obvious influence. Um, things like um, the linking. Um, we, we basically stole that directly from, um, you know, the Chronicles of Narnia, where you you link to other places. Um, I remember when we were designing, um, trying to come up with a way to link. We were thinking of, you know, one of the books in the Chronicles of Narnia. They fall into a painting, um, and we were really captivated by that. Um, and we wanted something that kind of evoked uh, that same sense. Um, and we, you know, the idea of like falling into this um, media, like this medium, this work, this, this artistic um, medium, and then going to that place really captivated us. And so that's a clear influence. Um, and we even had this idea of like, you know, wouldn't it be great if, if when you put your hand on the page, you know, rather than just a linking sound, you, you really, you had this whole visual associated with it, where you, you put your hand on the page and then you really fell, like the book was getting bigger and you just sort of fell into the page and the world was surrounding you. And of course, at that point in time, we couldn't do a visual like that, but that was our original, you know, that's what we would have loved to do. And if we did mist over again today, um, we, we would definitely do something like that. Because that's, the, the sound we did, I think, was our best approximation at something like that. So that was an influence. Um, I, I'm sure most of you know that Jules Verne, uh, I was reading a lot of Jules Verne books and um, I was reading um, Mysterious Island, which is where the name came from, and, and possibly the, even the idea for putting it on an island, which was just convenient anyway, but um, um, a lot of the visuals, the rocket ship for Mist Island, um, you know, that kind of thing, I, you know, that was again from Jules Verne. I was reading To the Moon and Back, and, and there was a lot of visuals that came from Jules Verne books. I was just devouring Jules Verne books at that point in time. So, um, and then, you know, as, as far as the history goes, um, it's just so hard to say because that kind of thing just came from um, so many disparate places. But I don't know how many people there know that. Um, I had started a, a novel before um, before we ever began Mist. Um, this was back when we were working on our, our children's games, and it was called Dunny Hut. And um, it was just this story of a kid who lived in a big like hut, but it was like this gigantic piece together. Um, um, well, 
like this gigantic, um, it was called a hut, but it was like this many houses pieced together. And he, dis he discovered a, a, a hole under his bed and he went down and there was a whole giant cave system down there. And, um, and, he, and it just went on and on um, and it was called Dunny. Not, you know, it was just D-U-N-N-Y actually. Um, and so we took that and we started developing that into a backstory originally. Um, and that's what we used originally to kind of turn into this backstory. And this, this, this area, this gigantic cave that this kid found, it had like a glowing lake and it was like a thriving uh, underground, um, you know, kingdom um, with people living down there. And, um, and that again came from <laughs> Jules Verne. I was like, I was so into Jules Verne. I like stole all kinds of things from <laughs> Verne. And it was like, a, I forget which book, a, a Journey to the Center of the Earth. And, and I, I could tell, that book was horrible that I was writing. It was absolutely horrible. Um, I don't know, it's, it's not in existence anymore, and I abandoned it, but it did serve as this backstory, which, you know, which ended up, you know, we got a lot from there. So that was, I don't know if we could call that an inspiration for us, but anyway. Very cool. Yeah. You want to read the next one? Sure. So, Asher Lockwood, uh, sorry, that's three, I can read. <laughs> So, Alex McTavish wants to know what the funniest mistake someone has ever made in the production of Mist and Riven. Are there any really great blooper stories? I don't know if any mistakes at the time we're making them would be funny. They're probably very upsetting and sad. <laughs> <laughs> well, in hindsight, you know. <laughs> in hindsight. Um, okay. Uh, um, when we were working on Mist, oh, this was upsetting. Um, the, when we, when I was rendering, um, you, I'll just preface this by saying, you know, every single shot took forever to render, you know, um, so, you know, 12 hours sometimes to render, 16 hours to render, so you look at those shots now and it's like, oh boy, those things could render in, you know, well, they would render instantly. But, you know, they, they did not. We would have these machines that are, like, as powerful as your iPhone today. And, uh, or a less powerful. I mean, they were just so much less powerful than your iPhone today. Um, and they were huge, you know, big tower machines. We just thought they were uh, so amazing. And um, so I was rendering uh, Channelwood Age. And I rendered out the entire Channelwood Age, and I did not make backups. And I set cameras around everything. And I made no backups for any of that stuff. And then we lost every single image and lost all the camera angles, everything. And it was a month's worth of work. And we were on these really tight deadlines to meet all of our. So that was not necessarily funny. <laughs> I wouldn't call it a blooper. I would just call it very sad. <laughs> To make up for that, we had to uh, we had to get a, you know we had to go out and buy another you know Mac Quadra, and then I was like working. I would just set a camera on this computer, switch over and set a camera on this computer, switch over and set this one rendering, and then I set up all these you know uh, images waiting to render, and then you know just trying to make up for work double time, and, and it worked. <laughs> so. Perfect. Uh, one second, people want me to turn down the microphone, apparently, so... Yeah, turn me down, turn me down. Oh, no, they love you, they hate us. <laughs> <laughs> also, point of interest, the live stream, we're kind of overloading the internet, so if everybody who's not us two could shut off their internet use for the moment, because they're getting severe lag. Uh, yeah. They're at about a 20 second. Before, Thanks, I, before I ask the next question, is that a disco ball behind you? Disco ball. Corner. Yeah, right there. Yes, um, we, we like to dance. 
Just checking. Um, Ash, Asher Lockwood would like to know, how did you make the linking sound? Um, oh, okay. Uh, that was simply, uh, Chris Brandcamp made most of the sounds. But that was something I did on um, the Proteus MPS Plus, which is just the synthesizer I used. Um, and I did, I wrote all the music on that, and then I was just like, hey, I'll make the linking sound. And, um, and so I forget, you know, of course I forget how I did it. Um, and I'm not a hunter, by the way, okay? I just want everyone to know that. <laughs> I hunt. Um, I got this at, at a garage sale, okay? <laughs> sure, sure. I, I promise, I promise. Um, okay, so, um, so yeah, that's what that was. And um, it was probably a combination of different synth sounds that I came up with and, you know, and then I'm, I'm doing the link sound. That was the <laughs> That's my it's very good, we can tell. <laughs> and then um and then it was the same thing for ribbon. We thought we could kind of improve the link sound, and that's what we did. You know, we did I did that on the Korg Trinity, um, which is what we were using then, what I was using to do the, the music on on that, and just sort of kind of uh, tried to make it a richer, um, more interesting sound. Cool. Pretty simple explanation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you wanna? You ask the question. So. Oh sure. <laughs> uh, so our, this is our office, by the way. Cool. Oh, nice. That's cool. I like the carpet. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They want to know if you're in a log cabin somewhere. Uh, we're actually in a garage. <laughs> How perfect. Okay. So this is the 20th anniversary of Mist, and we're still here in Mysterium coming out to celebrate your work and hang out with each other. And how do you feel about that and the fact that it's gone this far? Well, um... I, I guess more than anything, first of all, I, I guess more. I guess honored is the best way to say it because we would have never expected what we made to be celebrated 20 years later. You know, and it's um, no. It's it feels like um, I'm incredibly, you know, fortunate, and it's a little surreal feeling you know, to create something and then have people continue to uh, celebrate it 20 years later. Um, and like when it got into MoMA, that yeah. was, cr that was crazy. It was just crazy. And it's, um, um, and to have like Mysterium to continue to meet uh, year after year, it's just sort of like, um, it, it just doesn't um, I really can't put into words just because we never expected anything when we released it we just hoped we'd make our money back <laughs> you know and we hoped we would be able to make another game um, and so for people to for it to become like a classic game you know it, I, it's like this incredible incredible honor uh, for both Rand and I, you know, it's it's amazing. So I don't know. That's uh, that's that's about it. <laughs> okay. Um, the next one is from Matthew McKenzie. Uh, mm -hmm. He writes, "Do you remember the writers of Dunny Moo? It was a multi-user text-based social role-playing game, similar to a mud that took place in the city of Dunny, and the mud was at its height back in 1997 and 98 at the time of Riven's release." Very long question. Yeah, I don't remember that. I don't. Uh, well, I guess the last part, maybe you could at least say. Uh, did you like the idea of modern explorers in the cavern? Yeah, I don't remember this move at all. Um, 
And yeah, I mean, as far as liking the idea of explorers in the cavern, I think that's cool. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I don't I don't recollect this at all. And I, maybe I maybe I encountered it, but I um, you know, my memory is failing. I'm getting older. <laughs> I mean, not really, but. <laughs> <laughs> so Zephyr asks if you feel, still feel interested by Mist as a story and an art creation, or mm -hmm. have you basically moved on from it completely to newer projects? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, for the uh, I am interested in it, of course. Um, I yeah, I mean, I'm interested in. Um, boy, that's such a hard one to answer. Um, you know, I really love Mist, um, and and I I still feel to a certain extent like it's you know my baby, you know, um, and if uh, I still feel like it's precious to me. Um, and um, I, I certainly have moved on, and I'm doing other things now. Um, but yeah, I, I, I really, I am attached to it, um, and so I, I would love, you know, if there was something really, really, I, I could always see myself doing something interesting in that realm. It would just have to be really, really interesting, you know? <laughs> so. Uh, and someone on the stream says you are channeling your inner serious with that deer head. Um. So a bunch of people asked various questions that have been consolidated into how do you feel about the growth of the Mist universe post Riven? I have mixed feelings about that. Um, I, probably a lot of your audience knows that I feel like you know Riven was the end of the story, and so um, that was where you know I, I felt it like it was more of a trilogy in a way, like there was Mist. There was the the book, and then there was Rivet, and then the story kind of ended there. Um, but I feel also I've come to feel like maybe that's a little selfish of me to want it to end for my sake, um, and it, and because a lot of people have gotten a lot of enjoyment out of it, continuing on, um, and um, and I. I am happy that it's been able to continue on for that audience. Um, for me personally, I still it's hard for me to enjoy the, the continuation. It's hard for me to see this thing that I kind of had a visualization for and had like this vision for um, and and then see it past the point where I you know, had that vision. It's hard for me to really um, to go post-driven <laughs> with it, um, just because that's that's the story in my mind. And maybe I'm being short-sighted, or maybe I'm not being open-minded. But you know, that's that's what I envisioned. Um, but I am glad that people are able to enjoy you know everything past that point. And. Um, I'm, I'm glad it's there because it's because there that audience is there and that audience obviously enjoys all that you know it's it's the world was created and we created that world and now people can enjoy you know the world kind of doesn't end it doesn't have those boundaries and so I think that's cool um, it's just uh, it's just I have my own personal um, limitations with it. But. Um, as a follow-up that wasn't actually asked, but I think it goes off of this, uh, have you played the ones post-driven? Yeah, I, I do play, I have played, you know, I, what I always do is I'll, I'll get like I got missed three, and I started and I played probably um, 
I, I don't I can't say how much of a percentage of it I played and and then I'll, I'll start to get like these feelings of oh uh, you know this wasn't what it was meant to be you know this this the this, this story and um, um, you know and I'll, I'll do the same thing with every one of them like this isn't this isn't the visual design this isn't the visual uh, look and feel of, of what mist is supposed to be uh, this isn't um, you know that vernacular of the the, the 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 whatever it is. You know the the story, the visual, um, um, the production design, or you know whatever it is. I get hung up on these little details, and I think that's perfectly natural and understandable for um, for me. And um, and then I I stop playing. <laughs> so. Um, but I, I am, you know, like I said, I am, I'm glad that other people are able to play those and then enjoy those, and so. So, uh, Jordan Smith wants to know if you'd ever consider coming back to Cyan to start work on a new game. It, it doesn't have to be related to Myst, but would you go back to Cyan, would you go back to video games as a medium? <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that answers that. <laughs> Jordan Smith. <laughs> <laughs> um, Time for a serious impression. Um, <laughs> why, is, is Rand inviting me back? <laughs> well, I have him on uh, Skype here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um... I, <laughs> so ridiculous. Um, you know, I think that's. <laughs> I think that's probably not going to happen. But um, you know, it, a lot of that depends on <laughs> on the project. I and probably uh, yeah, no, in, anything is possible. I'd never say never to anything. So, <laughs> and that's all. That's all with that. <laughs> Do you think you would, maybe I shouldn't ask this, but do you think you would do games as a medium unrelated to Cyan? Sure. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, I could see that. I, I have come up with, you know, like, because it's in my nature, you know, I, I love, I really love that. And I've come up with, uh, you know, ideas for games. Um, they, but, you know, I'm also busy doing other things, but I've, I've, I have come up with ideas for, for games and, and just, um, and then they sort of like sit in wherever those kinds of things sit. And, um, um, but yeah, I, I, I think I could see myself doing something like that. At some point in time, maybe, if the chance arose. Right. Yeah. Uh, so you actually asked this, so I don't know if you want to ask it. <laughs> oh, hell, I forgot this one. Uh, all right, so kind of back to the Riven days of production. So when you did the Miss soundtracks, the songs were, you know, very much one one main theme with stuff in the background and then when you did the ribbon soundtrack stuff like Gen's theme that was a lot more layered with a couple themes and mixing and then of course you went on to do other music work which was in a different style but of your game soundtracks is there one of the styles that you preferred working in like over the other mm. well um, I like a lot of different kinds of music um, so it's hard to say but I, I think when I did the Riven soundtrack for, at least for games, I, I do like that for the games more um, because it, it sits more to the background and I, and I do think that was more appropriate to the games. It's almost, um, it almost sounds, some of it, it sounds like uh, just ambient noise or, you know, and I think that kind of, um, it, 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 it sounds like it's, um, not music. So, however, for music, if you're just listening to, uh, you know, um, listening to them as as, as albums, um, in retrospect, I, I kind of 
have, I like the, the Mist soundtrack, and because it's more musical. Um, now, I, I, um, it's not really well produced, and it was done in like two weeks, um, um, in a very, you know, just kind of almost thrown together. <laughs> Um, and but I, I really like the composition of it, and um, and it, and it's because you know there's a lot more thematic elements to it, and a lot more uh, clear musical elements to it, and that that's kind of the type of music I like. I like to be able to listen to things and and hear the musical elements. Um, so I think you know there there is some of that in the Riven soundtrack. Um, and those are the pieces I, I, I like to listen to more. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Tension would like to know. I did just, oh, can I interrupt for a yeah, second? Go ahead. Um, I did just, I think, n honestly speaking, neither of the soundtracks were, were completely satisfying to me because, from my point of view, just because they both still try to maintain um, marriage with uh, a, a, a with a video game, and um, which is great, but they still, you know, it's the game player which is in charge of things and which commands the presence. And so, um, in order for the soundtracks to work. They still have to lay in the, into the background, um, and so it was really refreshing and exciting for me to be able to work, for example, on the um, the soundtracks for this the film I just did, because I finally could do something that overtly tells a story. Um, and it, that was the sole purpose of the music was to just when the time came to like be there and to tell you know, a linear story and I'm not saying one is better or worse but from my point of view as a composer I, I like that kind of music you know and it's, it sounds better when from my point of view when you're listening to it as a soundtrack standalone or when you're listening to it in the context of um, uh, um, you know say a, a film whereas more ambient styles of music that's I don't necessarily enjoy those styles of music as much. Right. Um, still on Miss Soundtracks, Tanshin would <laughs> like to know: uh, Were you approached to submit the Miss Soundtrack to the Retro Game Music Bundle, uh, and how were the songs remastered? Yeah, they they came to me and said, "Hey, we would like to do this," um, and I was like, "I loved the idea," and um, but they didn't approach me with the idea of remastering it. But you know, I was I really have with the Mist music. It's always bugged me a little because it was always a little tinny sounding, um, kind of on the on the high end. It was you know kind of pushed to the high end a bit, and um, so I wanted to fix that. And um, and I've remastered music before, um, and I wanted to fix some other things with the music, and so I actually remastered it myself and so I did basic equalization um, I got across all of the pieces you know separate separated out one each piece on its own um, but I also did other things too like some of the pieces are uh, really are overly saturated with reverb and I don't know why I did that when I originally wrote them but they're just like you know I'm probably going off on a tangent here that most of your listeners don't care about, but I... I sure they care. They care. <laughs> <laughs> they care. Um, so um, I was, I thought, you know, there's got to be a tool that can take reverb out of mixes. And because there's like crazy audio tools. Um, and sure enough, there's a tool that can take reverb out of mixes. I was shocked. And so um, I found this tool, and you know, if, if you use it properly, it, it was great. It was like it was so refreshing to take some of that reverb, you know, just a bit of it out of some of these mixes, and it, you know, it, that was one of the things I did, and so that that was nice. 
you know, that, that was another thing. And then I did just some other mastering uh, things that just improved the, the sound a bit. So right now that, that uh, mastered soundtrack is not available, um, but we're going to try and then make it available again. It was just available for a short time, um, and then we'll, we'll re-release it again. The follow-up that I think absolutely everybody wants to ask, are you going to remaster the Riven soundtrack? Um, I don't know. I, you know, on it, I hadn't listened to the Mist soundtrack until they came to me for like I, years, so I didn't know what needed to be done to it, and so I just, I don't know what needs to be done to the, the Riven soundtrack. If something needs to be done to it, I will remaster it. Um, if nothing needs to be done to it, I won't remaster it. So. Because I just don't believe in, in remastering something unless something, you know, needs to be done to it. Right. So, but I'll totally do, I'll remaster it if something, if it needs it. So, yeah. All right. For you, what would be the elements needed to make a good story? Well, character, you know, is, is probably the first thing. Um, and uh, believable characters, you know, rich characters that um, any of us are interested in. Um, and then, you know, a good plot. Um, uh, and um, and I, I personally like a story where we, you've got at least one main character who, who moves from one point um, and, and learn, either learns something or, you know, to or, um, you know, has some sort of redemptive experience or, you know, I, I am not as interested in a film where that doesn't go anywhere. Um, where there's a character that just sort of like stays in the same place. So that's really important to me in any story. Um, and, in, and I think that's just as important in a video game. Um, and that's, I like to see a video game where that either happens to the, the player, you know, where it's kind of, where the player is kind of a provocation so that happens or, or should happen to the player or, you know, um, or that happens to characters in the story. Um, so, and I don't know if that makes sense. If we want to have a, you know, a whole interview just about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I bet people would would love to, but yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll finish the questions we have first, and then. Um, so that, no, was, and that was actually that was one of my frustrations. I think about video games in general is um, I really felt like um, video games would be able to uh, communicate profound story. Um, and you know we did miss, and that was really getting our feet wet with story, and um, and uh, and it does have story. I mean, it has story elements, and um, and then we did Riven, and we were going to tr try harder. Um, and and I'm not saying that either one of these are not good at all. But I kind of realized that, hey, what games are really good at is not necessarily story in that sense that, you know, more linear mediums are good at. What games are really great at is um, putting you in an environment, and that's an amazing, amazing power of that medium, is taking the player and just dropping you into this um, environment um, and it becomes a world um, uh, like an alternate universe and this is cool this is amazing stuff but it's it's just not the same thing as story you know um, they're just two totally different elements two totally different things it's it's um, and so you know it was, that was actually a little disappointing to me when I kind of realize that. And I actually, you know, even though there's been a lot of games that have attempted to tell stories, um, I am still waiting for the game that really kind of makes me, that really, you know, uh, tells a story that vastly provokes me the way, say, a film vastly provokes me. And, um, you know, maybe that will happen. 
Um, but and and maybe it probably will, you know, at some point. But I, I am I I think games are um, have an incredible power, but that's not their power. Right. Um, and that question was from Zephyr again. Thank you, uh, Zephyr. Thank you, Zephyr. <laughs> Uh, Alex McTavish would like to know what question do you mo what question do you most want to be asked in this interview and what is the answer to that question? <laughs> I really liked that one. Oh boy. Um, Other than the question I, that comes after this, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have one that comes to mind. Okay. So question 13 is, is there anything you want to tell us about Augustus Gladstone? And that's from the whole committee. Um, well, that's the film that I've been working on for a while now. Um, it's, okay, I'll just tell you, sure, there's so much I want to tell you about it. Go for there's it. So um, okay, so this is this film that is um, in the guise of a documentary. It's, it's not a documentary, for those of you who don't know. It's um, about a guy who thinks he's um, immortal. He thinks he's a vampire. And um, he, he lives in a kind of a bombed out hotel, um, a vacant hotel. And he's kind of fixed up one little room of this hotel. And it's all adorable. And um, this documentary crew comes in. We come in and we uh, follow him around. And so he, believing he's like around uh, 150 years old, that's what he tells us, um, he kind of begins to, well, he doesn't begin to, he feels like, you know, he wants family. Unfortunately, he feels his family has long gone. And he wants to, you know, he's he's longing for family. So the documentary crew, kind of, it's this story of this documentary crew coming in as he's looking for some sort of family in the world. And um, and then it's also the story of the documentary crew, because they're there, provoking things in in like his existence. Um, you know, because there's these cameras surrounding him. Um, he's normally a guy who just sort of quietly um, lives day to day in the background of society. No one really notices him, even though he's pretty outlandish. Um, but um, he, and now all of a sudden he's got like, you know, 12 people following him everywhere. And so um, this sort of like, you know, provokes a chain of events. And, um, and so that's pretty much the story. That's that's kind of at least a setup. So, um, other than that, I I, I can say that um, it was really interesting for me to do the project because I typically do have done a projects where I um, do a lot of planning and a lot of careful, careful. Um, meticulous almost um, setup and pre-planning and you know this was almost opposite and, and I wanted to do it that way because I felt I needed that um, this was um, um, this was all improvised the whole project um, except for a, a kind of a extremely detailed outline you know, so we knew exactly what scenes we were filming at every point in time. We knew where those scenes were going. Uh, we knew where they were ending. You know, um, otherwise we, it would have been disaster. But, <laughs> but, um, but that was it. Was very good for me, um, and, and and we did that because also it was a, a documentary, um, and so feeling. You know, we wanted to feel real. But, um, so everyone who was um, acting in the film did not have a screenplay um, to go by. And and whenever you saw the documentary, whenever you saw the crew being filmed, that was the real film crew. Um, we, you know, and, and they were nervous about it. You know, we were filming like you were, we were seeing the real 
um, producer on screen and we're seeing the real um, director of photography or you know the, the camera or the the camera crew the the sound department they're all on screen and everybody was kind of like taken aback they had never been in front of the camera <laughs> before and so here in this film they're all in front of the camera as as well as behind the camera filming things and so um, so that was really it was fun and uh, and very different for everybody so uh, and I, when is that going to be is available? That, yeah. Uh, well, right now we're about to, you know, we're kind of at, uh, you know, kind of a little bit of a holding pattern because we are thinking of submitting to festivals, except that I really want to get it out as fast as possible, which submitting to festivals um, puts a little bit of, um, it makes us wait. And so I want to. We might just, we, if we submit to festivals, we'll be waiting for a little longer. If we release it, we might just release it immediately, like onto iTunes and uh, Netflix and, and other, and everything else, you know, you can think of. But. So I, it will be out, you know, we're, we're thinking it'll be out this year sometime. Cool. Uh, that's the end that's of our pre-done pre questions, Steve. All right. You want to open the floor or anything? Yep. Does anyone have a question? Yes. I want to ask a question. You have to come ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you mentioned before that the later games didn't match the visual style that you had intended. And um, I was wondering kind of what your take on the visual style of the early games was, what you guys were going for. Okay, well, um, we even uh, evolved our visual style from Mist to Rivet. You know, I'm the first to admit that. So um, after Mist, you know, things became with Riven, and, and, and I think our justification for that was that Gen um, had a much more um, he had his own sort of um, vernacular um, and um, very geometric, you know, all across his island, um, Riven. Um, things were very, everything he had built was very geometric. There's lots of circles and, you know, um, semis, uh, you know, half of spheres. And um, so there's a definite. Uh, visual style on Riven that is not coincide with Mist. On Mist, I'm the first to admit that things were a little um, uh, haphazard, maybe, um, because we really, we, we kind of, um, we designed in a, it was designed very quickly. But it still came from one source, and that source was, you know, mostly me. <laughs> and, and so it, it still had a very similar flavor to Riven, which was a good thing. You know, I think that's good because then it's, um, you know, it, 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 there's, it's still, a, it resembles, it resembled Riven. Um, and so, um, when then when I saw certain things like and I'm not saying things like Uru are at all like bad or anything like that but it, it had a darker feel in my mind um, it had a little bit more of almost a Dungeons and Dragons feel mm -hmm. and um, and I didn't want Mr. Riven to have that feel at all we worked really hard pulling from other sources, visual sources, to give it a very different sort of feel. You know, like Riven, we pulled from Arabic sources and um, uh, and we gave it a very bright sky and, um, you know, Mist had a, a kind of a grayish sky or, you know, but we, we well, the one thing we'd really try to stay from, we stay away from, was having either of those games have like a D&D &D feel. Um, even though we were influenced by D and D, we we you know, and again I I hate, I don't want to put 
like <laughs> into like say it's bad. It's not at all. Um, but um, it's just because because it's all a matter of taste. Right. It's just me personally as the person who was the, basically the production designer and, and Richard Vanderwin too, you know, um, on on Riven. But um, you know, it's you. It's like you, you get very personal with it because it, you designed it. That's all. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I want to be clear about that. So I don't know if that answers your question at all. Yeah, it does. Thank you. I have a question actually. <laughs> Sib might glare at me for asking this question. <laughs> um, so I'm curious. Are you familiar? Are you aware that there is a group of people who are making a uh, real-time 3D version of Riven? Yeah, I've I've actually talked with them a little. Yeah. What? <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? Um, you know, certain aspects. Of, I mean, they're doing a great job of it. There's certain aspects of it I really like. Um, certain aspects of it I'm a little wary about. Uh, pause, pause your stream. Uh, we, we lost your... Hang on. <laughs> okay, I think we have you back. We, we lost you just as you started to answer the question. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I was... Um, I feel like certain aspects of it I'm really impressed by. Um, other other bits of it. <laughs> we might need to kill all the phones. Oh, we lost him. We did. Wait, do we still have you in audio? I have you in audio. Okay, <laughs> I guess we still have audio. So we, we heard that you were impressed with certain parts of it and then other parts. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to get me back in video or what, what should we do? Um, sure, let's try. Uh-huh. I, I We can't see you. If, oh, okay. Do you want me to hang up and then we just try it again? Sure, let's like... try that. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. <laughs> what? No, it's that that keeps going. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll take what we can get. <laughs> If it drops it a third time while you're answering this question, we're just going to assume that there's something <laughs> stopping us from getting the answer to this question. It's not meant to be answered. <laughs> so, as I was saying, <laughs> I'll, I'll answer differently this time. Um, I like, I'm going to just phrase this, the sentence a little differently. <laughs> okay. Um, certain parts of it I like, <laughs> and, um, and then I, um, I, I think that things like um, I, I think they're doing a great job of the textures and and building the models. I don't know how they're making it so accurately. Black magic. <laughs> He says it's black magic. I really am trying to answer the question differently. <laughs> And I am a little concerned because, um, you know, we made Ribbon and we worked really hard to create um, something that, that uh, provoked people, not just in terms of story or, you know, but visually too, even as you were clicking through the environment. And, um, and it's important that, you know, um, that that happens. So, you know, uh, when now, when you click through the environment, and now when you, it's real time, um, well, if you have total control over a real time environment, that affects how that environment affects you, how it impacts you. And, um, or if the sky is changing color, I mean, we, we made ribbon 
with that bright blue sky um, and clouds. And for one thing, it was stuck. The environment, the, the <laughs> sky was, it, um, even though it was, we, we used that as sort of a, um, we, were, we had certain limitations at that certain point in time, technical limitations, but we worked around those limitations. And one of the things we said was, okay, well, Gan has built a faulty age, and he's built it so the sky is, is always blue, you know. Um, and that was our workaround. But it's, it gives you a feeling, it gives you a sense when you're there on Riven. And the sense is like this blue sky, it impacts you. You know, when you're walking around an envir environment, it's like that blue sky has a real visceral, like a real um, emotional, a direct emotional impact. And if the sky is always changing color, you lose that. Now, um, I could see changing the color of the sky or changing day, and you know, that's, that's just one of my concerns. You, I think you could pull it off. But boy, you'd really have to have a, a, a designer on board to really kind of, you know, to do that. That's a, that's just a concern, you know, or or um, or or the way you move through the environment, you know, like we made mist and rift, and so like, and this is something we always said. So my grandmother could walk through those environments. The interface is, I mean, it's just so important. Well, if if you can't do that anymore, if it can't be that. Uh, full that clear. The way you go through that interface, that interface can't be that precise and clear. Um, that's a concern. All of that said, all that said, um, it's not necessarily a commercial product, and it might be just an exercise in recreating Rivet. So, in which case, I think it's pretty cool. You know, I'm pretty. I'm pretty damn impressed is, is kind of what it boils down to. So, you know, I, I, I don't know whether or not to be like amazingly impressed or a little bit concerned. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do know that they are putting in a point and click mode to make it move like the original did if you want it to. So your, your, your mother will still be able to play it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I'm getting glared at very severely <laughs> by the head of the project. <laughs> so I have a question from the live stream. That Andreas says that many tracks on the Riven soundtrack are in the key of G minor, and is it a coincidence that that's the fifth key from C? No, it's not a I've got really, <laughs> no, I mean, that is a coincidence, that is a coincidence. Um, I think what happened was I just got really fixated on, on that key, um, and I just really, um, like, just was in love with that key. <laughs> and any, is, are, how many people in the room are musicians? Uh, a few hands. A few hands, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I just was like, totally... Um, kind of just fixated or, or obsessed with that key, and um, and I also was thinking like, well, maybe it's, this is the key of, and I forget. I was thinking maybe it was the key of the Riven people, like uh, you know, or almost a um, um, as if it was um, there. You know, I don't even remember. I had some logic worked out. But I just got really, um, <laughs> I, I just got really kind of uh, taken by that, and I just began to write everything in it, probably too much. <laughs> I saw a hand, yes. Was there a particular part of Mr. Riven that's like one of your absolute favorite parts, be it a, a graphic that came out just how you wanted it, or a story element that just came off beautifully, or a puzzle that mm. just really worked out well? What's one of your absolute favorite parts from Mr. Riven? Okay, interesting. Yeah, um, okay, yeah, there's a couple. Um, I, I love it when you, when you walk up onto you know what is? I think it's called like what we called it while we were working on Riven 
was the Garden Island. Um, I think it's Survey Island, maybe. Um, and I love that walk across Survey Island. Uh, uh, and it has the spiky rocks, you know? Okay, clear. Um, and then you walk through that little pathway, and I really like that. And then there's, you know, you get to that sharp, that flat piece of rock, and there's the, the knife at the very top of it. I just, I love that area. Because it, one reason I love it, it does, there's no functional purpose for any of that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just this area of beauty. Um, and, and it is really starkly beautiful, almost kind of um, in a weirdly contemporary or modernistic way. It's just like, um, I, almost, um, I don't know, it's like no other area in Riven. Uh, so it's probably one of the, it's one of the first areas we made too, um, but the colors are gorgeous. Uh, it's so yeah, that's probably one of my that's my answer. I also actually like that whole island. I love the juxtaposition of the blues on the top of that island. You go down below, and then there's that elevator surrounded. It's got all those reds, and so there's like a staging that takes place. You know. Um, as you're down below, you, you go into that elevator, there's those reds, and you go down below that, there's that long hallway, and you don't know where the hallway is taking you. Um, and it's like this almost a blackish red color, and then boom, it, you enter into the Wark Cave. And like the whole island is, is, is just this exercise in staging, you know, um, uh, where it's just one thing, you know, kind of leads, is like taking you, leading you on to the next thing. Um, and we did a lot of that kind of staging in it. We really practiced that a lot. Another area like that was, you know, when you're walking down to the, oh my gosh, I'm gonna forget the name of them. Those, this, uh, they're, they're, those animals that are sunning on the rocks. They're like these, these half fish, half, uh, please, someone, what are they? Sunners. 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 The sunners? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, you're walking down there, you're walking down the stairs, and um, and as you walk down the stairs, I mean, boy, we set up the light perfectly, you know, just, um, this is what, this is one of the things, boy, if there's different times of day, this is going to be lost, um, so that, that it's almost like the rocks moving, a, a, as you move down, the rocks are moving apart like curtains, um, and then you see them as, as those rocks get further and further apart, and then there they are, and that's that was totally a conscious effort in, in staging that scene. And so there's a lot of things we did which were just, you know, like in a play or, or you know, the right kind of film, uh, maybe a, an animated film or something, where we, we really try to stage things. So, um, but I, I like I liked the center, uh, the center area as well. I liked that whole, with, you know, area. That's another favorite, I think. I do like I like the Wark Cave, you know. That's that's oh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. Thanks for the question. Uh, anyone else? Yes. All right. Earlier on, you had stated that um you off that you kind of wrote Mist off as the trilogy between the books Mist then Riven. Now. Yes. Had you like continued the story, would you have taken it in the same direction with like bringing in more of the Dunny, Yisha, and all that, or would you have done something completely different? Uh, I I think I would have done something completely different. <laughs> but that's not to say that the direction it went was bad. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> but so, um, yeah, like, um, I would think, for me personally. Um, I would not have gone that direction. Um, um, you know, uh, yeah, I, I probably would have gone a different direction. Would you, like, what direction would you have gone, like, if you had to just come up with a rough idea? <laughs> you know, I, you know I, I don't know. I don't know. I think it would have, I would have uh, probably, um, you know, I, yeah, I have no idea. I could never answer the question so quickly. I would have, 
it would have taken a long time for me to like you know mull that over you know to sort of think about that but I I don't even know if I would have I mean I, I probably wouldn't have done anymore you know I I really believe that it's it's not good to dwell too much on one thing um, on one project because for one thing it gets people tired and, and worn out on that project um, workers people who are working on the project they get kind of like oh another another missed project okay we'll work more on that thing um, <laughs> and I think actually um, an audience they would love to see even though they, they feel like they want the next missed thing <coughs> I, an audience really would love to see oh what is what else is Rand Miller going to do next like hey you know Rand Miller's not going to do another missed thing Rand Miller's going to do something entirely new you know and and you know I know my brother Rand's like amazingly creative so yeah he's going to do the next thing. rather I mean I would love to know I would love to see Rand do like you know something entirely new um, and because I, I know it would be amazing. So, um, and, and for myself, I, I, I just feel like I wouldn't want to work anymore on MIST. So that, I don't know if that answered the question. Yep, that works it's, amazing. It's a great question. It's a great question. Cool, thanks. Now, I would, I would add this to it. You know, you get 20 years later and, you, and you, then you begin to look back on something in retrospect. And it's like, oh, okay, well, that's, it's been 20 years. Yeah, I could see myself doing some small thing. I don't know if that would ever happen, um, but I could, you know, I could revisit that potentially. I, I can't imagine that would ever happen, but you could, you could think, you know, I don't even know what I'm saying. <laughs> It's a fun thought experiment, if nothing it's else. Fun, thank you. Thank you, man. It's a fun thought experiment. Anyone else? Anyone on the stream? No. They're quiet. Thank you so much for coming out today. Everyone was really thrilled to hear that you were coming out, and we're so glad that you made time for us and that we could speak to someone. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. I really enjoyed this. This was fantastic. Let us know when Augustus Gladstone officially comes out, and we'll be we'll be happy to jump on it. We will promote it all over the internet. We will. <laughs> okay. All right. Have a good right. afternoon. Thanks so much. No. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here.